will ever face. And I'm delighted that so many of you are interested in hearing uh, the perspective of those people who think it's very damaging for the Australian psyche. My name is Corey Bernardi. I know some of you in this room. I was a former politician, a recovering politician, I should say. <laughs> I, I have the great pleasure of um, hosting and emceeing this event tonight, which I say has been organised by Recognise a Better Way. They've sponsored it and funded it, and the great team of One Nation in South Australia have done a mighty job of encouraging people to attend. There is some housekeeping I need to go through quickly. Um, there are a few other people that are due to come in, but uh, so we've got a, a few vacant seats. We're going to have the guests of honour coming up in a moment. Um, there are, we're going to, the facilities tonight are going to be, we're going to hear from the speakers. Uh, we will then have a short break. During the presentations, you may uh, ask questions, and the questions should be sent to one of the text numbers up there. If you're on this side of the room, you send it to the text number on that side of the room. And if you're on that side of the room, you send it to the other one. If you're in the middle, you can make your choice, all right? You can just call it as you see it. I'd ask you to name the person you'd like the question to be addressed to. If not, I'll choose. That's uh, the MC's choice. We'll have a bit of a break just after 7 o'clock, and then we'll get into the questions. We'll all be wrapped up by 7.50. If you've got any pressing issues and you need to go out, there are bathroom facilities outside in the hall um, and uh, if there's anything else in particular you need, you can seek me out or one of the great One Nation team that are around. All right, without further ado, I would ask you to welcome the speakers for tonight. We've got Kerry White, who's a Narunga elder, Dr Gary Johns and of course the legendary Pauline Hanson. They're coming in. Here they come. Welcome. <laughs> oh, Pauline's going to join me up here. Excellent, Pauline. No, you can. You can do whatever you like or you can sit down the front. And I've also got to say that Sarah Game, who didn't walk in with the official party, but as the One Nation representative here, she's a member of the Legislative Council in South Australia, a really shining light. If you've heard of her, heard her on the radio or in Parliament, she's doing an amazing job. <laughs> All right, everyone's on stage. That's the way it should be and that's the way I like it. Um, as is customary at these events, uh, I'd like to recognise the traditional voice of common sense in Canberra, and that is uh, Senator Hanson. Um, <laughs> if someone had asked Pauline three years ago, would Corey Bernardi be MC at one of her events, I'm not sure she would have said yes. Because <laughs> we've had some spirited discussions in the chamber, um, but you know what? Throughout my period in Parliament and the time when Pauline was a public figure well before I ever was, uh, there's, I've come to admire and respect uh, what Pauline Hanson comes to represent. She is, as I said, a voice for common sense, but she's also the voice for the Aussie battler. She's the, the one that wants to give uh, uh, the voice to the people who really desperately need it. And she's the, people, the person that a lot of people turn to because other politicians won't listen to them. And it's a grave affliction, I think, that there's a great detachment between our political class and the rest of Australia. And uh, the more we can remove that distance, the better off we're going to be. And Pauline Hanson, you're a legend in that space. So I'll just say thank you. <laughs> All right, that's enough from me. We're going to hear from our first speaker now. And I'm under strict instructions. I'm going to gong people out when they've exceeded their time. So if you hear a bell go, you'll know they've got to wrap up in a couple of minutes. I'm not being rude, I'm just being told that's the way it's going to be. But our first speaker tonight is Narunga Elder Kerry White. Kerry was born in Port Augusta. She spent her early career as a nurse before running her own antique shop and a plant nursery. She's an elder of the Narunga people, who's greatly respected on the York Peninsula, and has worked in many community roles, including at the Port Pirie Aboriginal Community Centre. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kerry White. Good evening. 
morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. Um, now, my grandfather and mother and extended family actually come from Point Pierce over on the York Peninsula. Um, through extended family ties, I'm also Atna Matna, Ghana, Nukana, Wilpuri, and Pitanjara. And tonight, I'm going to share a few facts with you, some that you may have heard of before, and some of it may be new to you. Now, Albanese claims that the voice to parliament came about due to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. But the push by activists for a treaty began as early as 1888. Since then, there have been several recorded attempts, and in 1924, they began pushing the uh, federal government for a treaty. Bob Hawke, in eight, 1988, committed to a treaty by 1990. This promise, however, was broken in 1991 in favour of reconciliation. In 1989, ATSIC was established. Several Aboriginal organisations were set up under ATSIC to deliver outcome-based services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Neither the organisations nor ATSI delivered the, on the promised outcomes. ATSIC was not interested in doing the job that they were established to do. What then was ATSIC's priority? The answer to that question came in 1995 when ATSIC pushed the Keating government for social justice package including, you guessed it, constitutional recognition. Thankfully that didn't happen and was never implemented. In 2000, there was another push for treaty and constitutional change. Then in 2010, the Gillard government pushed for constitutional change. They didn't get it. In 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart emerged, but whose statement was it? The Uluru Statement from the Heart was orchestrated by Thomas Mayo. Thomas Mayo, by his own admission, likes the communist style regime and will be asking for rent, repatriations to be paid by the Australian people and the end game is money, power, control and the elimination of our current system of government. In 2017, Malcolm Turnbull rejected the Indigenous voice to parliament and it was stated at the time and I quote, the Referendum Council provided no guidance as to how this new representative assembly would be elected or how the diversity of Indigenous circumstances and experience could be fairly and democratically represented." End quote. Here we are in 2023 and that statement is as true today as it was back then. When Turnbull rejected the voice to Parliament, he was labelled as, and I quote, mean, spirit, bastardly, end quote. Now they just label anyone and everyone who opposes the voice as racist. Two years ago, news travelled through the Aboriginal grapevine that the Uluru mob were not happy about the statement. The Pitanjara and Yunkanjara are the traditional owners of the land that Chukara, Uluru, sits on. Numerous elders were shocked when they learnt that their names appeared on the canvas that they didn't endorse nor want. The canvas is um, Aboriginal term for document. Um, the elders want the Australian public to know about the lie that is being sold to them as factual. They have rejected the voice to parliament and they ask that you do too. This means that the Uluru Statement from the Heart is a fraudulent document that has been pushed onto every Australian as representing the will of the Aboriginal people. Aboriginal in groups have taken to Twitter, creating short videos with a simple message, we vote no. 
There are many pitfalls in the Indigenous voice to Parliament. One is in the name itself. The definition of Indigenous means native to a particular place or country. Therefore, anyone born in Australia is Indigenous and can be a representative of the voice in Parliament. This serves the activists well. The government seems unwilling to address the ticker box revolution. Why should they? Labor abolished the proof of Aboriginality back in the early 2000s. According to the census, there are 800,000 plus Aboriginal people in Australia. The actual number is actually half that. The average lifespan of Aboriginal person is 65 years of age. They have the worst health outcomes in Australia. Diabetes, heart failure and kidney disease topping the list. Aboriginal people for decades have endured high infant mortality rates. So our numbers have not increased significantly over the last 100 years. Aboriginal numbers according to the census soared since approximately 2005 when the government abolished proof of Aboriginality. Consequently, this means that the ticker box movement will be able to have a say on what happens regarding Aboriginal people without knowledge of the complexities and diversity within the different Aboriginal mobs. Albanese stated in one of his many media inter appearances in relation to the voice that billions of dollars have been spent on Aboriginal people and nothing has changed. The, that is an undisputable fact. The question is, why has nothing changed? The answer is simple. For decades, Aboriginal people have been exploited to gain millions of dollars in funding by Aboriginal organisations set up to provide outcomes for Aboriginal people. In the last three decades, a growing number of not-for-profit organisations have capitalised on the feeding frenzy. Health services also get a large chunk of the pie if they show that they can provide services for Aboriginal people. The sad truth is that Aboriginal people in rural and remote communities do not benefit from those billions of dollars. Organize, uh, another fact is that millions have been wrought by individuals within these organisations. Plus there is also the millions it wasted in the endless pursuit of a treaty, the voice and changing our constitution. The Australian public is continually being fed mistruths to support the elite's narratives to gain access to more power and more taxpayers' dollars. Back in the early 2000s, AHAC's Aboriginal Health Advisory Committees were working on a draft proposal to put forward to the government of closing the gap. We finally got it passed, but the gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal health continues to widen. Why is this happening? The AHACs were a community initiative set up as an advisory body working in conjunction with our public health system. The um, AXA, the Aboriginal Health Council of South Australia, they began convincing the AHAC chairs that they needed to go community controlled. So then this, they started the wheels in motion and the, when the AHACs dis found out that what they were uh, going to get wasn't what they wanted, it was too late. And coincidentally, AXA ended up with the billions of dollars every year for these, to run these services. Many of these community controlled health services ended up closed in rural and remote communities. And 20 years ago, some Aboriginal families re relocated from Alice Springs to South Australia because the health services in the territory were so bad. You may be aware that mining companies pay millions of dollars per year to some Aboriginal communities in the form of royalties. These communities are not thriving. Why? The reason lies in the way the royalty payments are structured and once again, the money goes to the elite and most of who 
don't even live in the communities they're getting paid royalty payments for. None of the royalty payments have been improved to, for living conditions. And you may be surprised, even angry, to learn that those receiving these royalty payments are also collecting Centrelink benefits. <laughs> they are required to disclose the royalty payments to Centrelink, but they don't. The supposedly stolen generation is another mistruth, which has brought about another Aboriginal organisation called Bringing Them Home. Back in the early 50s and 60s, mixed-race children were being removed and placed in institutions for their own safety. Mixed-race children were not accepted by blacks or whites and were being abused and in some cases died as a result of the injuries that they received in rural and remote communities. The problem is that in rural and remote communities, we are so far away from mainstream that a lot of things go unnoticed. But the elders in those, some of those remote communities, they set up dry zones in their community to combat alcohol-fueled violence. Well, that created another problem because the parents and the grandparents were abandoning the children in the communities to head up to Alice Springs where they could gain access to alcohol. This again left the children in the communities unprotected and were being abused. There is no denying things need to change if we are to improve outcomes for Aboriginal people in rural and remote Australia. What is clear is that we need transparency, productivity and accountability for all the taxpayers' money spent by these organisations and the government. What we don't need is more of the same BS that for generations has been built on untruths, half-truths and fiction. We, the Aboriginal people of rural and remote Australia, reject the tokenistic sorry day and welcome to country. The welcome to country was the inception of one man, a disgraced Aboriginal actor by the name of Ernie Dingo. <laughs> Aboriginal people in the rural and remote Australia were not consulted and we didn't want it. All the sorry day and welcome to country achieved for us was stir up racism towards us and fueled gang violence. None of us can change the past, but together we can change the future. Aboriginal people in rural and remote Australia want real change and tangible results for our communities. There is a saying, a new broom sweeps clean. It's time to clean house and remove the dead wood that is draining the public purse. Aboriginal people reject the divisive voice to parliament we are asking the good people of Australia to stand with us and reject it too. And to quote Pauline Hanson, we are one people, one nation, one Australia. <laughs>start to the evening isn't it um kerry you're bringing people together obviously people are very receptive to your message but you won me when you mentioned the words and and how people were referring to malcolm turnbull and it reminded me i've thought about referring to him in those words myself <laughs> i may have done so i've got something in common with the other team i'd also like to just acknowledge before we call our next speaker stuart eaton who is the ceo of recognize a better way the funding tonight and so i just want to say thank you to stuart wherever you are appreciate you being here All right, our next guest is uh, someone who's reasonably accomplished, if I can put it like that, in no specific order, but I'm going to put them in what I think is the priority. She's a mum, she's a teacher, and she's a veterinarian. 
I say that because everyone else says they're vets these days, but you're working with animals in the parliament as well as out of it, I think. <laughs> Sarah Game, and I want to know which one's easier, Sarah. Sarah Game is a relative newbie to the South Australian Parliament, but I have to say she's uh, lit up the scene. She provides a fantastic voice on radio and in the Parliament she's fighting the good fight, as you would expect from someone who is a grassroots advocate and really, really cares about her community. She spent time not only working as a veterinarian here in, in Australia, but she also went to England, uh, where she obviously experienced what's going on over there. She trained as a teacher and started looking after our children as well. She returned to Adelaide from the UK in 2016, uh, pushing on with a vet career and a focus on raising three young children. For some reason, she thought getting to Parliament was a good idea and uh, she became a member of One Nation, put her hand up at the last election. And I, for one, am very glad that she did because we need more people like her. Please welcome Sarah Gay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just want to quickly do some thank yous. Firstly, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming. We really appreciate that you've come here tonight and given up your time. Um, and I want to thank Corey Bernardi as well, who's given up his time uh, tonight. And I'm really grateful to Pauline, who's Senator Pauline Hanson, who's flown in, you know, for this event especially. And Kerry White, who's included me and tried to educate me um, on lots of matters and for that fantastic speech that you gave. And, and Gary Johns, who's written my favourite book, all-time book ever. Um, the Burden of Culture, How to Dismantle the Aboriginal Industry and Give Hope to its Victims. It's so fantastic. I think everybody should read it. I just want to give you a bit of insight into the state-based voice and the legislation. Um, but I, there's not a lot of detail to cover. You might be surprised. I will give you the detail that was covered, um, but that wouldn't take very long. So I've... Um, I, I, I want to give you a bit of the personal journey because I think um, a lot of you will relate to certain aspects uh, of that. So the State uh, First Nations Voice Bill 2023, it, it passed both houses and it was celebrated with pomp and ceremony uh, on Sunday the 26th of March this year. Speaking of the No campaign, the Attorney General stated in the Chamber in February Campaigns like these come at a cost and is one that is borne most heavily by those whom bigoted and hateful people are already inclined to denigrate and vilify. As I sat in the chamber that day, then the only member of state parliament to make my opposition to the voice clear, I glanced over to my silent liberal colleagues and I thought, wow, my life's really changed. I've gone from a loving mother of three small children, a popular small animal veterinarian, to member of parliament and racist, hateful bigot. In one instance, <laughs> at least in the eyes of the South Australian Attorney General. It did feel awkward, but soon I experienced that real frustration of this attempt to be shamed and guilted into silence. And it was a microcosm of how society was feeling outside the walls of parliament. People too afraid to speak out on their real opinion on this new legislation. Supporting and scaffolding those from impoverished backgrounds to achieve equal footing and access to opportunities is a key passion of mine. But regardless of our own history, personal responsibility and moving forward is what is required from anybody who has experienced trauma. I wanted to see the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in despairing conditions improved, as I did any Australian living in substandard conditions. It was for these reasons that I was advocating for the government to provide support based on need, not based on race. It was disappointing, but not unsurprising, to be so wrongly labelled. I was grateful to be given the chance to discuss the matter on ABC Breakfast the following week. Sarah Game, are you a racist? Was David Bevan's opening line. And well, I was grateful for the question because it hit the essence of why there was at that time very few no voices being heard in the open. 
What's the harm, said the Premier on ABC Breakfast of the Voice legislation just a week or so earlier. What's the harm, reiterated the South Australian Attorney General a few weeks later as he pulled over to ring into my ABC Breakfast interview. It was, astonished to hear, it was astonishing to hear these expressions of such low expectations of the voice that, well, who knows it will achieve anything, but at least it shouldn't cause any harm, which of course it will and already is. It does beg the question that if the state voice is not necessarily about outcome, is it in fact about ego to be the first in the race to establish a voice to parliament? It was interesting to me that both the Premier and Attorney General seem to find these statements satisfactory in light of the cost of living crisis, homelessness crisis, ramping crisis, despairing state of the child protection department, to name a few, to spend all this time, energy, money on the voice with the expectation that, well, it shouldn't cause any harm at least. 10.3 million has been set aside in the state budget for the state-based voice alone, but in reality, the legislation is committed to any resourcing needed. And with the infinitely expandable nature of the legislated voice, we really have no idea how much is gonna be spent now or in the future. Compare this 10.3 million to the mere 2.1 million being spent on emergency department avoidance hubs, the 1.7 million on the effective Aspire homelessness program, the 2.1 million on the family reunification process. One could be forgiven for perhaps asking the question, why don't we just put that 10.3 million towards real tangible benefits now? not on specific Aboriginal run programs, but on effective programs to address what we already know, high suicide rates, high adult incarceration rates, high numbers of children living out in out-of-home care, low school attendance rates. As stated, this newly passed piece of legislation is very likely to cause harm and in fact already has division, division within society, division within family, friends and work colleagues division about race, and it seems it's never been more about race than now. I experienced this division myself with a dear friend who seemingly blind with anger looked at me in disbelief as she asked, Sarah, why do you not want the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to have a voice? I tried to explain that in fact they, they already have a voice and that when we are talking about the voice, it's just the name of another web of complicated bureaucracy enacted by the South Australian Labor government, masked by the name The Voice, a piece of legislation, not necessarily a real voice for disadvantaged communities. And shouldn't we first be concerned with what the legislation actually does? I tried to explain that despite 3.2% of the Australian population identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander with 11 federal parliamentarians identifying, they were overrepresented at 4.85% of the seats. That with 30 billion a year spent on trying to bridge the gap and worsening outcomes for many, more money was not the answer. Unfortunately, blinded by her own compassion for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, she couldn't hear me and we've barely spoken. And that's exactly what the state Labor government's First Nations Bill 2023 does. It's divisive and it plays on the compassion of the South Australian people, who I believe, like I, want to see an improvement in the despairing conditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, as they do with the rest of the 132,000 people living in poverty, including 22,000 children, the vast majority of whom are not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. In my consultations in this state about The Voice, not only have I interacted with people of faith from the city, rural and regional areas who are against it, but the Aboriginal communities I visited didn't understand it and they weren't really interested in it. They were only interested in real tangible outcomes on the myriad of issues they'd already expressed and that had already been ignored by the government. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders question whether they'll in fact have their voice bypassed by the establishment of the voice. Before getting into the detail of, and I use that term loosely, um, of the First Nations Voice Bill, I just want to state that a, a bill like this absolutely fails to acknowledge that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are doing well, 
they're getting educated, they work and they contribute. And a bill like this labels everybody in the same boat as struggling and needing help and it's patronising. So the background concept of the state-based voice is to have a local First Nations voice that then report to a state First Nations voice. Who will be considered Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander for voting? Under the current model, there is no requirement for voters to submit any proof of Aboriginality. Who will be considered Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander for the purposes of standing for election? Anyone who regards themselves as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and is accepted by a community. Even the government are predicting problems and that we may need to appoint an Aboriginal commissioner in future. The bill passed with no commitment to the number of regions that would be represented, no stipulation as to the number of elected members in the local First Nations voice or the number of members that would be in the state First Nations voice and no cap on the number of separate committees that could be established which would all need to be manned by additional representatives. It was very disappointing that the state Liberal Party stated that they would not support and and they in fact did not support my amendment to limit the number of new committees that could be established due to their belief that apparently it interfered with the autonomy of the voice. So what was confirmed in the legislation? Well, resourcing's being confirmed for the infinite number of members that may be required. Uh, it's now being confirmed that there'll be six regions, at least 46 elect me elected members at local level, 12 of those acting at state, and there'll be another four initial advisory committees, but that makes up another 56 separate members, so we're up to a total of 102, but that could expand. The state First Nations voice can establish any number of committees. They just need the approval of the Attorney General. And then they'll be legislatively entitled to remuneration, allowances and expenses as determined by the Minister. Well, frankly, this reads as a blank cheque paid for by every South Australian taxpayer. After all this, does the First Nations voice have to report to Parliament or attend Parliament when requested? Well, no. They can be requested, but there's no legislative obligation. The state government passed the First Nations voice with no idea how it would ever interplay with a possible federal voice. You should also be aware that a range of other race-based legislation is passing through the houses quickly at the moment. In recent times, the Evidence Aboriginal Traditional Laws and Customs Amendment Bill went through with bipartisan support, as did the Magistrates Court Nunga Court Amendment Bill. In both instances, I was the only member of Parliament to oppose these bills. So in finishing, I made clear when I rose in February to oppose the First Nations voice bill, no amount of detail makes race-based legislation a positive step for Australian society. Segregating us by race is an enormous backward step. I'm gonna to continue to represent my constituents who believe passionately in personal responsibility and assisting those who are vulnerable and disadvantaged regardless of their race. This approach obviously includes supports and lifts up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living in despairing conditions without ignoring the fact that three quarters of those living in poverty or who are homeless or at imminent risk of homeless are in fact not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. It is not a fair world that we live in. My father taught me this at the age of five when I had a strop in a shopping centre car park crying, it's not fair. And I remember him so clearly stating simply, life's not fair. Coming from absolute poverty and disadvantage with immigrant parents, he worked hard his whole life to create a better one for which I reap the rewards. No matter our trauma history, one must ask what's next? Take personal responsibility. And it is this attitude we must engender to those we love, regardless of race, because it's the only way out. Thank you. Beautiful work, Sarah. It's a reminder that the devil is always in the detail and there is so much going on in the South Australian Parliament. 
let alone the other parliaments around Australia and in the Commonwealth Parliament, that we simply do not know about. We don't hear about it in the media. We only get it through representatives like you, Sarah. So thank you for that contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't really know where to start with our next speaker. Um, she is a legend. I started off with saying that earlier tonight. I mean, Pauline Hanson was the very first independent woman elected to the House of Representatives in Oxley. And it's fair to say she made a bit of a splash at the time. <laughs> and that splash is still reverberating around the country. And I have to say that for a lot of people, they look at Pauline Hanson in a new light over the last 20 plus years because she's proved to be one of the most resilient individuals in this nation. She wasn't someone born with a silver spoon in their mouth. She probably wasn't uh, uh, setting herself up to go into parliament. She was a, a small business operator. She was a mum. She's committed to her children and her grandchildren. And she's committed to all of Australia. And I can say that because I've seen how passionate she is about the work and the representation she takes up there in Canberra. Had the pleasure of working with, with Pauline, working against her on occasion. She won every one of those battles, I regret. <laughs> but I've forgiven her for making me look foolish. Um, but it's just... It's rare that in this country we have people who are prepared to put it all on the line for us. And I mean that in the most genuine sense. She just wants this country to be the best it possibly can be. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Pauline Hanson. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Wow, what a warm welcome. Thank you very much. And for the kind words, Corey, I don't know if I won every one, but anyway, we had about a lot of times and most of the time we did uh, agree on a lot of matters together. Um, you, you know, I listened to Kerry's speech and it really meant so much to me to hear from an Aboriginal elder to speak the truth and what it means. And uh, wonderful speech, Kerry, and everyone appreciated. Sarah, you have no idea how proud I am of you. And um, a baptism of fire. Did I tell you to, be, to wait and expect maybe you'd be called racist? Because that's, um, that comes with uh, being a One Nation Member of Parliament and that was my baptism to the Parliament myself many years ago and being that lone voice. My message hasn't changed. I'm not a new kid on the block. I've been saying it right from day one, equality for all Australians. Trying to point out... <laughs> and uh, I remember after I was le elected on the first day, and you're right, Corey, I was running my small business. I just thought, hey, um, I don't like the way the country's going. I thought... I'm going to get in there and have a say and try and do something. And when I jo finally joined up to the Liberal Party, I only stand as a candidate. I had nothing to do with politics apart from being a local member of Parliament. And I remember going to the first meeting and um, someone asked the question, not me, but they said, um, I remember it was John Moore, Shadow Minister. He said, sit down, shut up, you know nothing, we know everything. And I thought, whoa. I, what am I getting myself into? So I happened to actually stand my ground on, on something. They... They threatened me. They told me I had to apologise. I refused to apologise. I actually expanded on it a bit more and made it worse for them. And, of course, John Howe was terrified, so I had to go. Well, it was the people of Australia that got behind me and there was just myself and my campaign manager. We had 42 booths. Do you know what the public got behind me? We actually manned all those booths. We actually, I went on to win that seat in 1996 with the biggest swing in the nation. And that was the safest Labor seat and the only one that withheld the overthrow of Whitlam. And uh, it used to be Bill Hayden's seat for 27 years. So it was like, yeah, John Howard. And I've got to tell you this. When, I, when we were getting sworn in, um, I was walking out of the chamber with Graham Campbell and I could hear behind me, excuse me, excuse me, finally after three or four times I looked around, it was John Howard and he said, oh, I just want to congratulate you on your win and I said, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> and then I turned around and went talking to Graham Campbell. So anyway, um, I'd say in that period of time over the years, although he didn't need my numbers, but I caused him so much heartache because a lot of people were actually then turning to One Nation and because he was losing a lot of support from the Liberal National Party, he then took up a lot of the policies I was expressing, turn back the boats, um, deportation of criminals after 12 months here if they weren't Australian citizens, many um, 
abolishing ADSEC. That was another one of mine in my maiden speech. So, so there has been, so there has been a lot that I've been able to achieve, but it's only because of, this, of you, the people. I was your voice on the floor of Parliament, and without you know fear or favour, standing up for what I believe in, expressing my opinion. Um, regardless of all, everything that you get thrown at you, because I take my job seriously. This is my country. I love it and I'm passionate about it and I actually, you know, feel for the people, my fellow Australians. Regardless of whether you're supposed to have been here, for, uh, you know, the connection for the last 65,000, I've even heard 100,000, or whether you're actually born here of my age or, or this century, or whether you are a migrant that have come here from another country to, to, to live here. We all have a right to this country and everything it has to offer. And that's what I stand for, no matter who you are, what your background, race, colour, creed. My job is to represent all Australians fair and with a balanced view. And what is the best outcome? I can't please everyone. No one in the wide world. We've all got different opinions. But what is fair and just? And I don't see that happen on the floor of Parliament. I, I, it frustrates me to no end. And at this point of time, with the voice... I can tell you, it is going to be the most important thing in your life you will ever have to make a decision on. It is bigger than buying a house, your dream home. It is bigger than getting married. You can get out of both of those. <laughs> but I assure you, if we get a yes vote on this voice and it's put into the Constitution, a whole new chapter, we will never get out of it. Because once that is done, I'll tell you what will happen. It's just a matter of words and they say, oh, we just want an advisory body to the Parliament to give us some advice on legislation. But it's also, they can prioritise matters of concern or importance to them to put to the government. So what came up the other day was about Australia Day and Linda Burney is saying, oh no, that's not important. I'm telling you this, we cop it every year on Australia Day with the protest rallies, that is going to be top of the list, I can assure you, and there'll be change with it. The voice, if it's not, um, and constitution lawyers have said, if you actually have, um, you don't listen to them, and that's even my private legislation that I might put up. I have to actually consult with them. All legislation that concerns the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the Indigenous people of this nation, they have a right to actually have a say in it. Do you know that 80% of Indigenous live in cities and urban areas? Do you know that only 20% live in rural and remote areas? So you see, all legislation affects all Indigenous people. So this is the big concern. So once it's in the Constitution, there's no wording to it. Section 51 of the Constitution states that you'll have a whole list of it. Um, oh, golly, there's quite a lot of it. Um, how many in the 51, Section 51? I'll explain to you. Yeah, 51, Section 51 of the Constitution explains different things like the government makes laws on coinage, on lighthouses, on postals, communications, and it's just one word, marriage, okay? So then the government of the day can go and make whatever legislation they want to. So when you put it in Chapter 129, the new chapter, with a few words they have, you're giving permission to the government to go and make whatever legislation they want to. And part of that legislation, what they could do, is actually form another state in Australia. So they could carve off the, the Northern Territory. As long as they don't take any other state in part of that, so if they don't carve off anything from Western Australia, South Australia or Queensland, then it doesn't have to go to a vote by the people. Also under this, this new law, not adhered by the Constitution, they can actually increase the numbers of Parliament, which they have an inquiry going on at the moment. And a couple of years ago, 
Don um, Farrell, he actually said to me, do you agree with increasing the number of senators to 14? I said, no, I don't. I said, we've got too many senators now. I'd rather cut it back. So that's what they're doing. And I can assure you, it will be setting aside an extra two senators in every state who will be for Indigenous people only. Or if they take over the, the Northern Territory, at the moment they've got two senators, if they take it over and make it a state under constitution, they have to have 12 senators. So I want you to think about these things. I also, how many of you know that 50% of Australia is under native title and another 10% pending, which they believe will be passed? The, the coalition government moved, they had the land councils, now it's the land and sea councils, giving them rights over, over waters above and below the ground and in Commonwealth waters. So that can also be challenged. So it, it's very dangerous what we are proposing, what they want us to do. And there's no, there's no real definition to it. We're not being told what it is. Oh, trust us, okay? <laughs> we, we know what's best for you, just trust us. I wouldn't trust them as far as I can throw, throw them, and I, and I know because I've worked with them. And don't you be fooled by it. Don't, please do not feel emotional over this whole fact because, as I said, and I said it in my speech on Parliament on Monday, I said, I've heard right from the beginning there was 40,000 years they've been here, then it was 50,000 years, then it's 60,000, now it's 65,000. And I said, and even some people are saying 100,000 years. You know what? I don't care. I really don't care. Because at the end of the day, where do I come into it? Where do you come into it? What's your connection? And, you know, to think that it's only an Aboriginal that has a connection with this land. I have a deep connection. I have a, such a connection that I would actually go and fight for this country. If I could go and take up arms, if anyone wanted to invade this country and take away our democratic right and freedoms and way of life, I would fight to the death for it. That's my connection to Australia. But it's also, what about the farmers? Don't they have a connection to the land? What about the men and women who did sacrifice their lives in the wars to protect us and give us what we have today? What about the, the migrants that have come here and they uh, love this country and they, you know, blood, sweat and tears have gone into it as well? What right does an Aboriginal or a Torres Strait Islander or a person who calls himself Indigenous have more right to this land than I do because of some connection going back so many years ago? It's about the here and now. And as Carrie said, you can't change what's happened in the past. But what I hear all the time from this idiot who sits beside me in the parliament, Senator Lydia, Lydia Thorpe. <laughs> now, I think you know who I'm talking about. You know, what a nasty piece of work she is. And the whole fact is, all I see is this, this hatred, this division, this divisiveness, instead of trying to pull people together. You know, this is not what Australia should be about. And they say, you know, they haven't been recognised. We have now the Aboriginal and Torres Strait flag flying in the parliament. We never had that. We haven't been asked as a country to accept that. We actually have um, welcomed the country every morning. It used to be the prayers, then welcome the country. No, they reversed that. And, I t and I'm sorry, when I'm in the parliament, that happens, I turn my back on it. And... <laughs> I'm the only one because Kerry was right. This wasn't their culture. This was Ernie Dingo. This has been, you know, all being brought on by we've got to feel sorry. And Kerry was right. You know, it's about the stolen generation. And now if they're not game to take the kids away from these dysfunctional homes because of child sex abuse or they're not being looked after, the kids are... Um, in homes where there's domestic violence and other thing, everything that's happening because you're accused of the stolen generation. You know, and I said in Parliament also, what about the stolen generation of the convicts that were forced to come out here? Yeah. What about the children that were taken away during the war, the Second World War from England? You know, people have faced atrocities over the years, but this guilt trip has to stop if we are going to be strong and united. 
We also have to take note of the fact of what has happened in New Zealand, and I'm hearing from people all the time, the division that's happened there since they've allocated seats to the, to the Maoris. It doesn't work, and we've heard this week that you go, they're prioritising um, your health issues based on your race, and that's not right. You know, Sarah was right about the people living in poverty. There's no pro monopoly on, you know, health issues or, you know, people that are homeless, people living in their cars with their children or caravans or couch surfing. This is a problem faced by all Australians at the moment. And here in your own state, your Attorney General, he claims to be Aboriginal. And you know what your Premier said? Oh, I'll accept a statutory de declaration from him. That's okay. Did you know that? Yeah. No. So said he's accepted it. A stat deck, he, he can be Aboriginal. And the definition of Aboriginal is to, to actually be of Aboriginal connection to the land. Um, and then you have actually can be um, accepted by the elders and communities. And the third one is you can self-identify as an Aboriginal. And Kerry is right. When we brought in the referendum in 1967, it's put to the Australian people, that was really to change section 5126 of the Australian Constitution. Because at that time it said that the government could make specific laws for any race other than the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. That wasn't the, the founding fathers of our constitution being racist against Aboriginals. That was put there so they can make specific laws for Chinese and the Afghans and those ones that came here, migrated here to work the gold fields and to deal with the drugs that were brought into the country at that time. That's what that was there for. So the people voted to get rid of it. Now it states that the government can make specific laws for any race. So they actually have that and they do utilise that in legislation that they make. So it is there for people to actually, for the government to make specific laws if they want to, but they want to enshrine it in the constitution because once they do that, they implement seats in parliament, then they control the numbers in the parliament with the Labor, the Greens and the Indigenous, and then you have the moderates from the Liberal Party, the wet blankets, the bed wetters, those as well, they're all starting to change. They need to be gone. And they're the ones that's why you will never get it changed back again. So your voice will be gone. So think very seriously about it and talk to people about the truth of what this is going to mean. How am I going? Nearly finished? Finished? <laughs> oh, okay. Look, at the moment, what I'm trying to get is accountability. I put up a private member's bill for um, identifying Aboriginality. They didn't vote on that. They denied me the right to introduce my bill on the floor of Parliament, so they've stopped me. I want uh, a Senate inquiry into it. No, they've stopped me as well as for that. So they don't want accountability. I'm now investigating um, with whistleblowers that came to see me about misappropriation of monies. These um, organisations, we've got three, over 3,200 separate Aboriginal corporations and land councils in the country. We spend about 33 billion a year on these uh, Aboriginal issues. We the census at that time, first one in 1971, was just about 116,000. It's now at uh, 812,000, and between 2016 to 221, it grew 25.2 percent. So it was um, they they're not um, the mortality rate is not shown on the census when the rest of the population only grew by 8% with migrants as well. So a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon claiming Aboriginality, which is not the case. So it's not about money, it's about the people with um, lining their own pockets, misappropriation of monies, and it's not getting to the Aboriginals. I've been to these communities, I see what's happening, but every time I speak about it, I get held down. But I will keep fighting this fight. I want accountability for the taxpayers' dollars. We have a right to know where it's going. I want to stop the corruption and, I, and the people have a right to know. But to each and every one of you tonight, thank you for coming. Um, I hope, um, you know, I've... Um, <sighs> I'm not a career politician, but I say I speak from the heart 
and I'm passionate about what I do. I thank you for those people that have voted to put this woman into Parliament down here under the banner of One Nation. We hope to increase those numbers over the years because at the end of the day, you will gain from it with true, dedicated passion and honesty from my members of Parliament and that's why I encourage them to be upfront, honest and what you see is what you get. Thank you very much for coming. Great work, Senator Hanson. It's uh, nice to hear you speaking again rather than just on the television in person. I've had the great pleasure of enjoying your speeches for many years. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a campaign that unites a lot of us from disparate political groups, uh, from different political organisations, that perhaps in areas where we don't always agree. We're recognising that there is a better way for this country. It's a way where it doesn't matter whether you've been, your family's been here for a thousand years or a thousand days or you became a citizen ten days ago. We are all Australians and we want the best for this country and we want the best for all of us out of this country. And I say we're disparate political citizens because the next speaker is someone who was a minister in the Labor government. Dr Gary Johns was, uh, described himself as an economic rationalist on the way in. He said he was only one of two in the uh, Keating government um, and the Hawke government. Um, I don't know anyone that is not a rationalist who's interested in economics. There's plenty of irrational people out there, I guess, but they're certainly not interested in the future of this country. That's what I would say. But uh, Gary, Dr Gary Johns was in the House of Representatives from 1987 to 1996. He held the Queensland seat of Petrie, for the ALP and he served as a minister in the Keating government as I mentioned. He's also the author of the book that Sarah held up earlier, The Burden of Culture. It's an excellent book and I'm sure he'll reference it a bit today. Gary's encouraged Aboriginal leaders right across Australia to provide guidance to people in remote communities on how they can be their most successful selves. He said Aboriginal leaders did not need a change to the constitution in order to be successful. He's a committee member of Recognise a Better Way. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Gary Johns. Corey, thank you. It's a delight to be with you. Have such a, an exuberant, enthusiastic crowd. Um, and, and of course, to be here with Sarah and Pauline and Kerry. It's wonderful to be with people who are all on the no side. Now, uh, Sarah posed a question which I'm going to try and answer. She said of the South Australian legislation, what's the harm? And we might pose that to the referendum. What's the harm? I'll tell you what the harm is. Aboriginal people are modern people. They all have mobile phones, especially the kids. You cannot escape the modern world. But what's happened, it's certainly in the last 30 or 40 years, is that about 20% of Aboriginal people have been prevented from making use of the modern world. That's what's killing their kids. And we did that. Up until 1967, the assumption was that Aboriginal people would learn how to live in a modern society. It wasn't our society, it wasn't a white society, it was just the one we we're all gifted by thousands of years of history. And of course we brought it to this land. But there was no turning back. You have to learn to adjust to the circumstances that are before you or the consequences are dire. So I was talking to an Aboriginal woman from Fremantle recently, uh, a woman of my age, and she said, we did all this in 1967. We did everything you asked of us. We are now teachers, doctors, accountants, electricians. We did it. We came into this society. What more can you ask of us? This is the tragedy. This stupid idea will mean that the last 20% who are in crisis the children who are being sexually abused, the women who are being beaten, and the blokes who don't know what the heck they're meant to do in this society are being held out. 
1967, uh, Kath Walker, Ujuru Nunuckle, known up our way in Queensland, said, wrote to the, the effect, um, the white man had to become civilised, now it's our turn. Now, you couldn't say that today without getting into trouble. But it was true that we made a transition too. We were all once hunters and gatherers, but we moved on. And we were gifted that. So I think we've brought a gift to this country. And most Aboriginal people are grateful for that gift. How many? Well, I say it's this. About 80% of Aboriginal people are doing about as well as other Australians. We don't hear about that so much. But it's the last 20% who've not, to use an old term, come in. Who are the last 20%? Tragically, 20% of Aboriginal men have been to jail. 20%. A lesser number of Aboriginal women, but unfortunately climbing. Now, those people are just recycling in that system because for the last 30 or 40 years, we've said being Aboriginal is enough. You just stay there on collective title and do your cultural thing and then we will bring things to you. And as an old uh, vicar mate of mine who was out at, out at Owen Pally for many years, a, a missionary, a good man, he, got, he left because he was sick of burying children. He said, these people are radically disabled because there's nothing we will not do for them. So therefore, there is nothing they can do for themselves. So if you want to cast blame, you can, you can blame us, that's okay. But the job now is to bring the last 20% in. Now, how do we do that? So in 1952, when I was born, there was an advertisement in the paper from the University of Sydney uh, for scholarships for Aboriginal boys. Old term, really, but our society was open at the highest level for Aboriginal people to come in and, and make best use of our greatest, or in Sydney University's case, once greatest institutions. So for 70 years, the door has been open. And it's been mostly taken up. But today, you can go to any number of communities, especially in remote Australia, and you'll find childcare centres with beautiful infrastructure there with few or no Aboriginal children in them. What has happened here is that it's not that we don't provide the access it's just that some Aboriginal people no longer want it. So there's an attitude which has grown in the last several decades that says, you owe us, you give us everything we want, but we don't have to play your game. Now, that's a cruel attitude. It's the attitude, it's the culture, if you like, that's killing Aboriginal people. We are not killing them because we're not listening to them. In fact, one of the worst things you can do is listen to the victim. Because the victim will always say, if you give me more, this wouldn't have happened. But we know that giving more makes them less able. So how do we get around this? Right now, there are children who need protection from their own homes. So Best Price, this is Jacinta Price, Senator Jacinta Price's mum, is deputy principal of the school in Alice Springs. She's trying to, I think it's Yipinrinya, it's hard to pronounce. She's trying to raise funds for a boarding house in her school in Alice Springs. She wants those kids to be in boarding schools to be protected from their own families. Now again, you can blame us for that. It doesn't matter. How are you going to save these children who need protection from their own families? And there have been at least six 
commissions and royal commissions of inquiry into Aboriginal child sexual abuse in this country. The evidence is clear. You go to many of these communities, most of the children have been sexually abused. Might have been from white men, but mainly from their own because these communities have turned in on themselves. They are crushing themselves because we stopped inviting them into the open society 50 years ago. How do we do this? The whole idea of self-determination, collective self-determination is what's killing Aboriginal people. So the game now, and the voice would be a little cherry on top, says only an Aboriginal person running an Aboriginal organisation can do good things for Aboriginal people. Now, I can tell you that's a death sentence because I've looked at a lot of those ag Aboriginal organisations and the claims they make about being better at or for Aboriginal people are just wrong. The proof is not there or the proof is that the claims uh, untrue. So if you go down to Nowra, say, in uh, New South Wales, southern New South Wales, and as I have and I've talked to a woman there running uh, a, women, a women's child centre, and you've got to be very sensitive when you have these sort of conversations. I say, do you get any Aboriginal women in here? Yes. Well, why don't they go to the Aboriginal controlled health centre up the road? Because, and she said, well, <coughs> If you're in the wrong family, they won't help you. So collectivism is a bad thing. We, I presume, don't worry about who runs the local GP's clinic or what family they're from. We just know that they'll be well trained and we'll get good medical advice when we get there. So the whole idea of Aboriginal self-determination is a very nasty ideology. I'll tell you where it got a big boost. Into the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And if you look at the five volumes of the uh, Commission's report, yes, I've read them all many times, there are 250 different mentions of Aboriginal self-determination and not one of them defines it. They were groping for an idea. And it was Mick Dodson who wrote that stuff. And I'll tell you about the Commission. The Commission was an inquiry into the deaths of 99 Aboriginal people in custody. None met their death by ill means. The police or the custodians did not kill them. Most people in custody today die because of ill health. They're in jail because they are knocked about badly, usually on drugs. The Fortunately, the number of deaths in custody, black and white, has, has dropped over the years because we do take more care, we have more insight. But then in 1991, the proportion of deaths in custody for blacks was the same as for whites. And we knew that after six weeks of the inquiry. The government suppressed that and went on and they turned it into this mega social science exercise in promoting self-determination. So the whole course of events since then is about Aboriginal self-determination and the voice, if you like, will be, you know, the pièce de résistance. It will really embed it in the Constitution. So let's come to the voice. Oh, by the way, remember that earlier this year, Noel Pearson, was singing the praises of the Uluru Statement, which was voice, treaty and truth-telling. Then they realised that wasn't going down so well, so they hid Uluru, which is difficult to do. It's a big rock, but they, they, they got rid of it. And then they just started to talk about the voice. And then when we good people got started to, st started to get stuck into the voice, they now just talk about recognition. So the thing is quietly fading away over time. Hopefully to a point where we smash it in the next couple of months. And I don't mean, that's a rough term I know. But we need to defeat this heavily to send a signal that we're not going to continue down the path of Aboriginal self-determination. 
because that's what's preventing the last 20% from having a decent life. It's a killer. And I say to the Noel Pearsons and Marcia Langtons and Tom Kalmers of the world, have a look at yourselves. What was your journey? How come you made it without change in the Constitution, without a treaty, without truth-telling? What's your story? And you'll find that the answer to the woes of the 20% lies in the lives of the 80%. We've done this. You know, the intermarriage rate between black and white in this country is about 70%. Like, that's reconciliation. You don't need a treaty between, well, maybe you do, between a man and a wife, <laughs> Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. How can you have a treaty between an Aboriginal and a non-Aboriginal partnership? 70% of all Aboriginal marri or ma marriages with an Aboriginal person are with a non-Aboriginal person. The reason the numbers keep climbing in the census is because the census, the ABS, encourages any child of, a dis any child of an Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal person to be known as Aboriginal. So people tick the box. That should be of no consequence. We, we should set a target in this country that says there should be no race-based programs by 2030. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it can be anyone's glass, of course. Uh, th there really shouldn't be because if we have to define race, it's a very ticklish issue. And... And I say to many of my friends who want to go down that track, I say, why bother? We shouldn't have any programs based on race. And then you can remove that ugly conversation about race. And just quietly, uh, and with great respect, um, you know, in 1901, this was a British society. You know, we were 98% British. And then there were... Uh, a very well-defined Aboriginal society. That's just not true anymore. You can walk down the Rundle Mall and wherever and you'll find people of all races and all countries. So with great respect to Aboriginal people who are often no longer as identifiable as they race once were, you're just not that exotic. I'm not being crude or rude there. I'm just saying it's... It's just not as different as it was. You are modern people. You're less distinguished than distinguishable, as are we. And we, too, are trying to work out the best way to work and grow and live in this country. But some Aboriginal people have... S the lesson stopped. The lesson stopped. So the work that... Uh, church people did up until the late 60s was very sensible because they were providing food and shelter in a sense and they were bringing people in. Aboriginal people mostly came in voluntarily because it was easier to get food there than do all that hard work out in remote Australia. But having come in, the rules changed because women would often find comfort inside uh, the church or the grounds of the area because they didn't necessarily want to be going with an old man. So the Aboriginal society meant that old men took as many young women as they wanted, pretty much the same as we did in earlier generations. But when women found that they were protected by the church, they started to change their culture. They realised there was a different way. And then, of course, there was the explicitly integrationist notion that you should learn to read and write English. Now, was that destroying their culture? I guess it was. Was it destroying their languages? I guess it was. But that's a done deal. That was done a long time ago. And by the way... Um, if you're a person speaking Aboriginal language 
here and then you wanted to talk to someone 100 kilometres away, you, you couldn't understand each other. There was no unifying language among Aboriginal peoples. Fortunately, there is a unifying language in Australia today and it's English. It could have been different, you know. The Dutch might have had the North, the French could have had the West, the British could have had the East Coast. Um, I don't know who would want South Australia, but you know. But <laughs> that's terrible. Cut that out of the film. You know what I mean? We could have been a nation, well, a, a country of many nations. We could have had wars on this land between European nations. So we should be grateful we just had the one group who came in with some of the best laws known to man and woman anywhere. So there's a beautiful little, how are we going? So there's a beautiful little story I'll finish on, um, which is about the bloke called Cable. He came in uh, as, uh, on, on the first fleet as a criminal, convict, that's the word, Gary. And he lost his belongings. Now, you think that'd be game over. Mate, you're a convict, right? No rights. He sued the captain of the ship and won. <laughs> that was the importation of British justice from day one. Now, it hasn't been a, a clean rollout, but nevertheless, white men were hung for murdering blacks at the very earliest stages. And that doesn't mean to say there weren't awful violence by whites against blacks and the reverse. But that is history. Why would we tell those truths again when the only known truths are written down by us? It can't be any other way. There's one truth and I'll leave you on this. The real truth are the stories of Kerry White and other people uh, around Australia, other Aboriginal people, many, some of whom, sorry, are sitting on our group, recognise a better way. The truth is their life path. How come they made it without a treaty, without uh, a voice embedded in the Constitution and without truth-telling? So hats off to Kerry and all those Aboriginal people who are prepared to vote no. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can tell why, you can see why no one on the yes side wants to debate Gary Johns. Um, it's a, a compelling argument about how well so many in our society are doing. We have so many questions, we're running a bit behind time, that is entirely my fault, so we're going to go keep going straight into it. The first question was about are any copies of Gary's book available for sale tonight? The answer to that is yes, they are, they're out the front, you can get them on the way out, and I recommend you do so because it is a great read. Okay, this one's to no one in particular, it says, uh, why won't the government release all advice from the Australian Solicitor General on the voice proposal? I'm throwing that to you, Senator. Okay. Okay. Why why won't the government release all advice from the Australian Solicitor General on the voice proposal? Were you meant to use these? Yes. Yes. Why won't they release it? Because they're ashamed to release it. They don't want you to know the truth. There was, otherwise, if they're upfront and honest with you, they would release the information, but they're not going to. And um, as um, Gary John said, the information changing all the time. It was about the voice. It was about the treaty. Makarata Treaty is actually a treaty. Remember they're talking Makarata? Makarata Commission is really a treaty. So um, they're actually trying to fool, fool us, fool you. Um, as I said before, do know your information. Research it, listen, and you've come here tonight to listen, but uh, you have no um, need to feel guilty because you might be white and feel guilty because we owe the Aboriginal something. We don't owe them anything. We are all Australians together. That's what it's about. 
Okay, the next question is from Karen, and it's to you, Kerry. Can you speak to the statement, this land is Aboriginal land, always has been, and always will be? Well, the Aboriginal people might have been here before colonisation, but since colonisation, this land belongs to all of us. We are all Australian. So um, if anyone wants to debate that, you just say, well, you belong here too. All right, Gary, I'm throwing this one to you. Is there any guarantee that the High Court will not give the voice greater powers than are specified in the legislation? No. <laughs> no. Um, just very briefly then, um, it doesn't matter so much the words that describe the power of the voice. It will have a chapter on its own. You know what else is part of the chapters? The Parliament, Executive Government, the Judiciary and the States. Any High Court judge will see this thing called the voice sitting on its own. If it just had that word alone, they would have to say this is meant to be an institution of the standing similar to the others. And over the years, High Court judges will begin, I think uh, you, you're pointing this out, Pauline, will begin to fill it out and flesh it out. And you can bet Parliament won't do a thing about that. It can't do a thing about it. Do this and we are in big trouble. I'll just All add right. to that, it comes down to the judges themselves, how they interpret it, so they can actually expand on it whichever way they want to lay with it. So if they've all in uh, agreeance of the voice to parliament, they are actually, and the Aboriginals having um, a say, they can actually come down with the determination that you and I may totally disagree with. So it's their, their decision. Okay. This one's from Lydia. I mean, Adelaide, does anyone know where the bloody crazy horse is? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not sure. I don't know, that, I don't know about that. Can I ask... <laughs> um, can I ask for a please explain? I'm a Queenslander. Yeah. What's he talking about? <laughs> All right. You don't want to know where the crazy horse is, but wait, trust me. Um, OK, this one's for Sarah. In the event that the federal voice is voted down this year, and we hope that it is, is there hope of rescinding the state's First Nation Voice Act in favour of a more targeted, effective and prudent measure? Uh, well, that's, that, I guess, is what's really important to everyone and hopefully... I think the only, the only hope to have that legislation uh, removed, uh, essentially, and undone is to give One Nation the balance of power at the next election. That's, that that actually, it actually is the only hope. Uh, because you won't get any commitment from a liberal, uh, the Liberal Party at the moment about that. But we, we certainly would make that a top priority. And so I think there is hope. Um, and the hope is by the vote uh, from, from you guys, the public, um, to give us the, the balance of power. And then that, that's the only hope, Corey. Thank you. <laughs> Kerry, I'm getting a lot of questions about Aboriginal culture and mythology and beliefs. So I hope you don't mind if, we, if I throw them to you. If you can't answer them, um, that's fine. Uh, and sorry, they keep flowing in. I'll just go back to the one where I was about to ask you. The Uluru Statement from the Heart says that sovereignty is a spiritual thing. Do you have a comment on that? Um, well, the Pitjantjatjara, Yunkinjara people, when they talk about uh, Uluru, they talk about all their ancestors. If that takes in all the elders, uh, as they say, um, it's not just them, it's all the elders in the past. And, and uh, before um, the lands got divided up further, that used to be all the pit lands. So there was not just Yunk, uh, Yunkinjara and Pitjantjatjara, there was a whole heap of other Aboriginal mobs in it as well. So... Um, that they get their spirituality from there and they get their dreaming from there and um, they pass that on to future generations and basically when it comes to Uluru, they just want as Australians to understand the significance of Uluru, the connection that they have to Uluru and to the land 
and to respect it. You know, you can go there, they'll be quite happy to talk to you, they'll be quite happy to share their culture with you and have a discussion. I mean, you know, before the government got involved with Uluru, you used to be able to go up on to the top of Uluru, you used to be able to walk all around the base and they were, took pride in taking people on to Uluru and all around. And then along comes these activists and say, well, we're giving Uluru back to the traditional people. Great. But what happened when they did that? The traditional owners can't even go to Uluru no more. They got kicked off their own land. They had a cottage industry going from Uluru before that happened. So, you know, all these interventions have only created harm to Aboriginal people. They have not resolved anything. So if we stop dividing Aboriginal people from non-Aboriginal people and all the rest of it and just collectively come together to work as one, as a nation, then we're going to resolve a lot of issues. And just on the Aboriginal thing, um, now I've worked in health for many, many years and it wasn't just about Aboriginal people, it was about those that were suffering from low socioeconomic backgrounds. They were just as bad, if not in some cases worse off. So we need to focus on that. This one's for Pauline. Isn't it true that even if the voice vote fails, the government can legislate to implement it? Why don't they do that first? That's right, they can. By legislation, it can be removed by the next government if they have the will. So legislation can be changed. Putting it in the constitution can never be changed unless you take it back to the people and another referendum to have it removed. That's why. They need to enshrine it so it cannot be taken out. And that's what Senator Polly from Tasmania said on the floor of Parliament. We need to enshrine this in the Constitution so it can never be changed. OK, for Sarah, how has your last year been in the Parliament after being the first person in South Australia to oppose the voice? Did you get a bad rap from the media? And I'm going to add, from the public. Well, that's such a great question. Firstly, I, I just think it's such a privilege. On the whole, I just think it's a very privileged position. So I try and take that attitude. You know, lots of people are suffering and have a very difficult life. And so I really think that, um, you know, I shouldn't really complain about anything. And I'm very grateful for the position and I take that burden and responsibility really seriously. So um, that, that's my attitude on the whole. I guess it has been difficult. You know, I'm a mum, I've got three children, I want to make them proud and to feel good about who I am. And so it can be difficult when you are labelled um, unfairly. And that's why it means so much, really, to have um, you come and support. And I know many of you write to me as well. And it, it really makes a big difference, actually, in helping keep my energy uh, there to represent you fully, which, which I, I take seriously. I think the media on the whole have been um, fair to me. I don't expect that necessarily to last, um, but I feel um, they were fair. And I, I was grateful actually to the ABC Breakfast uh, to give me that time. I mean, they gave me about 30 minutes um, to explain why I was at that time the only the only person um, against, against the voice. It, it was difficult to be the only person in the state to come forward at that time and, and take that position. And I'm grateful for Gary, and he knows this because his book um, just gave me the, the absolute uh, facts and evidence and confidence to say, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think yeah, you can take criticism quite well when, it's, when, it, when you know what you're doing is right. It would be remiss of me if I didn't point out there's a great show on Sky News at 7.30 on a Sunday evening with a magnificent host, but uh, I'll leave that to you. Um, Gary, I'm going to ask you this one. Who selects the people on the committee of The Voice? Yeah, th this is really important. Uh, the Cal Melanchthon report, which the Prime Minister <laughs> refers to as the potential model, right? 
was too frightened to say that Aboriginal people should elect their delegates. They're going to select them by some mystical means. And there'll be 35 regional persons selected. And I asked a person a couple of months ago, how come there are 35 regions? And she said, oh, they're the Aboriginal health regions. Uh-huh. So who's going to get selected in each region? It'll be the biggest CEO of the biggest Aboriginal control health service. So those 35 will then select 24. Who will they be? By definition, CEOs. So that's the way the system will work. That is a corrupt system. I'm not saying the persons selected are corrupt. But us, we politicians, at least had to try and get 50% of the vote or reach out, you know what I mean? You're at it all the time because you wanted to get re-elected. This mob does the opposite. It says, I'll have my little group of people who depend on me for their livelihood who'll make me the delegate. And so it goes up. So when they get to Canberra, they'll be asking for your money for their organisation. It's that narrow and that's a corrupt system and that's the one that the Prime Minister refers us to. Uh, here's a question for one of our, either our current um, federal politician or our former one. How does the referendum pass? Each state needs to have a 50% pass or 75% pass. How many states need to pass before it's agreed to change the constitution? Who would like to take that? Pauline? Well, I'll have a go, and if I don't All get right. it right, you can have a go. <laughs> All right? We'll share. <laughs> OK, to, to get the referendum passed, you need the majority of the states. So we've got six states, so you have to have at least the majority. So that's four. You have to get four states up. If it's three, three. And not only that, you have to have the majority of the vote as well. The majority of the states and the majority of the votes. So that includes the territories. Gary, do you want to add to that? Just to clarify that the, the territories, the ACT and the NT, only are counted in the national vote. They can't be selected separately. Yeah. So we, good people, only have to win three states. South Australia, Western Australia and Queensland. B Victoria, forget about it. <laughs> so we, I, I was born there. I don't own it. I don't understand it. But I moved and got out of there. Uh, we're working hard in Tassie as well. New South Wales could be. So we only have to win three states. It doesn't matter how big the national vote is. So can I just clarify, they need to win both the popular vote, meaning 50% plus yes. of the national vote, plus the majority yes. of states. And yes. so even campaigning in a seat like Tasmania just to prop up the no vote or get it as high as it can be, or Victoria, is actually critically important to... No? For instance, in 1977 there were four propositions put to referendum, three passed, one failed. The one that failed had a 62% national vote and it failed because it failed in three states. So the national vote doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, they've got to have both. We just have to have one. It would be unusual not to have a national... Um, you couldn't have... A, a national majority and, and not have, well, you could, I suppose, anyway, a majority of states. We just have to win three states. It doesn't matter what the national vote is. Yeah, there's a question about um, some of the financial figures that were used, and one relates to Aboriginal royalties. So I'm going to throw this to you, Pauline. Are Aboriginal royalties taxed? No. So um, we don't know exactly where the royalties go. As Kerry was saying earlier, having a discussion, she said a lot of these people get the royalties, they don't even live in the communities and they're getting the royalties and it's really, uh, and it's not split to all the families um, who are actually living there. So that needs to be, and a lot of these um, royalties, I remember in, I did a big survey in 1996 when I came into the parliament and um, at that time we'd bought just listen, to the, the, what we've done for the Aboriginal people, we bought 70, 76 stations, cattle stations for them, which actually cost more to run than what it did actually buying it over the period of time that they had it. And at that time, Northern Territory alone was getting $36 million in royalties. 
In the last land council, the central land council, and I had a look at this because they've been under the audit, uh, been audited, and um, they've actually, apart from the monies that they received from the federal government, they actually got nearly eight, well, $82.9 million in royalties. So apart from the government assistance and grants, they're making millions of dollars in royalties, which is not even going to the people to help them. So what we're saying, it's not about, you know, um, it's not about the money. It's about the people who have used the Aboriginal people as fodder to push for their own agenda and keeping them in poverty and in these conditions because I've been to these communities and my heart goes out to these poor children who are sleeping on the streets at night just to get out of their homes. I'm talking about little kids like this who go to the school and sleep in front of the school on the streets just to get away from the homes and the families because the sexual abuse, the drug abuse, the domestic violence and they want to blame me because I'm white. Well, it's not good enough and I'm sick and tired of it and that's why we have to make them accountable and their conditions will not change. It's all about money, power, control and that's what these people are pushing for. The Thomas Mayos, you know, slowly he's releasing what they want and uh, what these Aboriginal, Aboriginals want. I asked Marcia Langton, what was this going to cost? Oh, no, we haven't even looked at that. And Albanese says, oh, it's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> what a load of hogwash, because there's 24 of these advisors that are going to come to Parliament House. They are going to need advisors themselves. They're going to have le legal representatives. They're going to have officers. They're going to have staff. They're going to have travel. It's going to cost billions of dollars. I can promise you that. It will. There will be a never-ending um, blank cheque that's going to be, have to be written out by the Australian people for what? To make us feel inferior in our own country and we ha have a right to our um, democracy that we know as it is. We vote for people that we want to represent us and they have every opportunity to stand for Parliament as they do and represent all Australians. Okay, we've got time for a couple more. A uh, question for Kerry. How can we give actual Aboriginal elders support and a greater platform on their no vote to voice to Parliament? Their voice isn't being heard here in town. Um, no, unfortunately, no one has ever listened to Aboriginal people in rural remote areas. Um, as I was saying before, we don't exist. They forget about us. But what you can do is just spread the word, tell everybody to vote no to this divisive voice, a voice that is going to kill Aboriginal people in rural remote areas because nothing will be get done about the alcohol fueled violence, the abuse that happens to children, be it sexual, physical, emotional, mental, you know, and they changed the laws a few years ago. Um, you ha I worked for the welfare and you had to consult head office that we had one person sitting up there saying how to treat Aboriginal people. Meantime, these Aboriginal children was being left in abusive conditions, and I mean horrible conditions. You know, you had little six-week-old babies being given alcohol so the parents could go out and party. But we had to wait for authorisation from head office to do anything about it. So we need that to stop and the only way we can make that stop is vote no to the voice and have a better way of doing things. Yeah. All right, the, last, the final question for tonight, I'm going to throw to you Gary and I'm also going to ask you to perhaps answer it up here so you can give some closing remarks uh, for tonight. How did native title get going in the first place? How is it even legal under Australian law? Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's a bit of a tough one. Uh, you have to blame us. We passed the law uh, in the Keating government and I was a member of that. Look, there was the High Court determined uh, the Mabo decision. Actually, Eddie Mabo's claim failed, but it was his other people on the island that succeeded. Sorry, Eddie, but that's the way it went. 
And it was a decision of our government then, or a government of which I was part, to place that decision into legislation. In other words, to regularise it. It could have gone through the courts <coughs> and spread across Australia anyway. So native title's a done deal. The second part of recognise a better way's offer is to talk to native title holders. They are legal holders. I'm not going to undo, I'm not going to campaign to undo that law, but we need a new conversation that says, is this working for you? And most of them will say, no, there's nothing in it for us. And this is a really interesting bit. What are the children of the original native title holders think about native title when they've moved on and moved into state and moved into the modern world? That, I think, is the conversation we can all have to say, what better use can we make of native title? So that's my answer to that. Um, le let me sum up and thank people. Uh, first of all, uh, Stuart Eaton. Thank you, Stuart, for organising this evening. Uh, Stuart from Recognise a Better Way, our group. Thank you. Uh, and uh, in a Kerry was answering this as well. Kerry is on our board. Our board has uh, two white blokes, John Anderson and myself, and seven Aboriginal people. And we want to have no voting Aboriginal people speak out and we're trying to provide that forum. So go to the website and you'll see the wall of faces. There are a lot of Aboriginal people who think this is a terrible idea. Um, Pauline, uh, I've followed you for a long while too and uh, you, you've got heart, you've got guts. Uh, good on you, I, I support that. Yeah. <laughs> And Sarah, you're too young for any of that yet. <laughs> but but I, I saw you, maybe it was on Corey's show, I don't know, but you, on, on Sky and I thought, wow, this, this girl, he's got some, or words to that effect, you know. I thought, yeah, that's, you know, a, a younger, articulate, new politician just prepared to stand up alone against the whole Stra South Australian Parliament. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, look, I'm a born optimist. Uh, when things look a bit dark, don't doubt that there are young people who want to know how this country works, right? They will go and seek out the answers. So it's important that we have the conversations and they might say, oh, you silly old buggers and all the rest of it. Don't worry, kids do listen. They're not just listening to their teachers, their woke teachers. They're writing the essays because they need to pass. Yeah, we know that game. But when they get out of school or university, their minds are still operating. They're looking, they're looking for... This doesn't add up. What's happening in this country doesn't add up. It doesn't ring true. So we should all be optimistic. I think a new generation will continue the fight for just sensible policies, for goodness sake. Uh, and there have been a, a lot of outstanding people in that regard, Corey Bernardi being one of them. Thank you, Corey. Um, thanks indeed. And if you've got 40 bucks in your pocket, there are books for sale out the back. Thank you. Corey, I just want to inform people, we said that um, for this to fail, the no vote needs to get three states up. They believe it's Western Australia, Queensland will definitely vote no. South Australia's on the borderline. So you really need to go out there and talk to your family, friends, colleagues, everyone else, explain what you've heard here tonight, research a bit more, but if we can get South Australia over the line, it'll go down, all right? Yeah. So anyway, thank you. No pressure at all, folks. So um, this has been a wonderful evening. I've certainly enjoyed being a part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have too. Would you please thank our speakers tonight? <laughs> there are books out the front to buy. I'm sure there'll be autographs to sign as well. But ladies and gentlemen, good night.